Welcome to the Queen City Soccer Show. I am Level Up Luke. I'm joined today by Clay Dimmick, the captain, Hugh Roberts, Superhuman. How are you boys doing today? Good, good. Thanks for having us. Yes, sir. Appreciate you having us. Absolutely. I mean, we're here to talk about FanFest, so I, I guess let's get that out of the way. Charlotte Independence, tell us a little bit about the team. For the folks who may not have been to a game yet, what is the Charlotte Independence all about? And uh, tell me about FanFest coming up. Yeah, so I guess I'll go first. Um, we like to think of our team like a family, but we also know we put a good product on the field. Um, it's a professional soccer team playing out of American Memorial Legion Stadium um, down in Elizabeth. So it's a good environment for families to come to, a good environment for passionate soccer fans or anybody who wants to check out a game to come to. And uh, I think they can be confident that they're going to get a good product on the field as well. So it's something we take pride in every game. Yeah, it's one of the unique clubs and environments that actually intertwines the players players and the fans as well too so this is a you know a rare unique opportunity to come meet us players socialize with us you see us on the field playing but now you get to meet us personally have conversations and get to know us almost on, on a human level and that's rare for any pro club so it's one of the reasons I came back as well you know I love that the club gets involved with the community as well it's very important nice and speaking of coming back why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey yeah it's been a long road I mean it <laughs> started here in 2019 had three good years here. Just did the last two years out in Monterey, California. I was fortunate to be the captain of the team out there. And that was a, a great experience as well, too. We you know, got the third place halfway through the season last year. And you know, just through injuries and ups and downs, you know, it was just overall for me personally, a good experience to now come back here. Like again, as I mentioned, just being with people that I know and familiar faces just gives me an ease of mind where I can kind of perform to my best of my ability. So honestly, it's just been, it's been great to be around family, friends. I've, I lost that for a couple of years as well, too. So just at this point in my career, it's definitely needed. Awesome. And uh, we're in the middle of the preseason right now. I know you guys have had some contests on the road. Um, we're still waiting for that first game back here at American Legion Memorial Stadium. What is preseason like for you guys? How do you uh, approach it mentally, physically, as you're gearing up for the season to start? Yeah, so I think a, a big um, positive this year is we're returning a bunch of guys, as, as all the fans can see on social media. So we have a good base, a good chemistry to go off of, and then um, getting people back like Hugh and maybe some other guys that haven't been announced yet, but um, they just upgrade our team and bring us to a different level. So. Um, it's guys that have played together before, which is a huge plus. And then once you have that chemistry, preseason also is about the fitness. I know us players, we hate doing it, but it, it's necessary. So building that base to be able to go through the season and then um, building our identity, how we want to play and uh, what we want to do on game day starts in preseason. Nice. And as far as the identity for the team, like you said, you guys have played together. How would you describe the style of play of the independents? What can fans expect? Uh, in terms of either formations or, or general mentality from the team on the pitch? Um, I think we want to control the game by being on the ball, um, but also we want to control the game when we're off the ball. We want to set the tone. Um, we want teams, when they come to Memorial Stadium, to leave never wanting to play there again. Um, and when we go <laughs> on the road, we want to uh, kind of take this thing out of the environment and get points on the road as well. So we want to we want to set the tone with and without the ball. Yeah, I think coming from last year, you know, the team made it to the final for me personally. I haven't had a ring yet or a championship in my career. So that's my only mission for this year personally. So, you know, you're seeing a team that's coming together that was runners up last year and now add some key additions as well, too. It's hopefully coming together for an exciting year. And that's, like I said, my goal at the end of the day, too. So it's good to be here. Have you have you made it to uh, to a final, to a championship game? Not as a professional, not yet. Not no, yet. That's not right. Yet. Well, hey, we, we got it in store for you this season. Clay, yeah. what was it like last year, making it all the way to the championship, uh, fighting for that spot in the playoffs, and then making your run? Yeah, I mean, I had a unique perspective last year, obviously, with the injury. So um, I knew going into the season, Mike was building a good roster, so I knew we would have a chance. But a lot of things have to go right from day one. Like, you have to fight through the hard times, and then you have to go on some runs here and there. But um, I think everybody in the group battled, and everybody in the group had an important part, and that's what took us all the way there. And it leaves a bit of a sour taste in your mouth when you lose a final like we did in penalties when you led the game for a while. Um, but now we just are ready to go even more and we know that it's not going to just come in October. We have to do it from March 16th all the way through. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I know you were able to join us in the, the mech reserves at the tailgate towards the end of the season when mm -hmm. you were back on your feet. Yeah. Um, and that kind of leads me into my next topic here, which is just your inspirational story. Can you tell me about the injury what happened? What were the symptoms, the yeah. diagnosis? 
walk me through the, your yeah. story as much as you're uh, comfortable with. Yeah, for sure. So uh, it was back in the end of July, beginning of August. I had felt like pain in my neck after a couple of games. Um, and that's how it started. We really didn't know much. I thought I slept wrong or thought like playing with my kids, I just had a really sore neck. As a dad, I yeah. understand that. Yeah, I yeah. totally get no. it. <laughs> the kids are crazy. So, And then um, I began to get symptoms such as like an electric shock or tingling down my left side. So like if you hit your funny bone, yeah, that's what I felt from like my neck down. Like a shooting, like yeah. nerve pain? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So then, like you said, nerve pain, our trainer thought it was just a nerve thing. So we're doing all the dry needling, doing nerve glides, nerve flossing, all this stuff, trying to get it to go away. And then... I began to like lose function on my left side so like I would get neuro tips which is like little needles and I couldn't feel them for a little bit and then I didn't have control over my arm or my gait so like walking and oh, stuff. Wow. Yeah, yeah so one thing led to another when that happened we just like drew the line we're like we need to send you to the hospital so I went and got like blood work because I didn't know what was wrong and then fast forward a day went to the neuro neurologist did an MRI then that's when they saw like the ruptured discs in my spinal cord or compressing my spinal cord so there was no signals being sent down and so like the, I had like a really strong headache and they're like yeah that's probably why because nothing is being sent up and down right. your body so then uh, a month later I ended up having a neurosurgery and I got two discs replaced in my cervical spine so wow. right here and they went through the front so I have kind of a gnarly scar now. yeah but um, after that was probably the hardest part because then I started rehab and um, it was hard because it was like a neurological rehab so I had forgotten in my brain how to like control my left side oh wow yeah and and so I had to like learn how to do everything like use a fork button button zip zippers pick my left foot up to my right side and just a whole journey but thankfully I'm back now and so thankful and blessed to be back now but that's kind of like a long story made short hopefully <laughs> that's crazy and I saw the video that the team put out where uh, you guys were talking about it was a not necessarily a novel surgery, but the application in the sports environment and being able to return from that sort of a surgery. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so um, the surgery itself has been out for 10 years, 10 to 15 years is when it got um, approved by the FDA. And thankfully, um, the one of the guys who was on the FDA research team for that is was my surgeon. So. Um, when I found out that and found out that he offered a second surgery instead of the fusion, because if I were to get the fusion, I'd have to retire. Yeah. And I, it was three levels, so I wouldn't have much mobility. So he said, like, I, he thinks I could be a good candidate for it. I'm young, healthy. And so I went with him with that. And um, God willing, if I play in the first game, which is the plan, then um, I'll be the first professional athlete to have a two level cervical disc. Um, there's a couple NHL players that have one level. Wow. Um, but nobody has two yet. So. That's wild, man. Yeah. Um, as far as the, the PT and the uh, the work you did coming back from that, it, any advice you could share with somebody else who's working through yeah. that kind of a process? Um, yeah, I think like you said, it's a process because there are days, like I remember the first day I went to PT and my physical therapist was also a spinal cord specialist. She, had, she wanted me to pick up my left leg and, or so we started on my right leg and I did it fine and then I went to my left leg and in my brain I was picking it up and I looked to the ground and like it wasn't moving so I just like and I'm not a crier but I just like broke down and like I was like dang this sucks and she like picked it up for me she's like look this is gonna be a journey you didn't realize how much stuff you had lost until you start doing stuff right um so like my wife loves Amazon so when Amazon packages came I would usually open them but I couldn't open them because my left side wouldn't work. Oh, so it was wow. just like all these little things that make you realize. But then now I'm just so grateful to do the little things. I'm more aware of like how many blessings I do have. And so just really like enjoying the process. And um, in my case, it, we weren't sure where the journey w would end. And we still aren't because it's a new ground. But um, just taking each day and realizing like you can get a little bit better each day and be thankful for what maybe you couldn't have done yesterday that you can do today. <laughs> That's a great message. I appreciate you sharing that with me. From that superhuman recovery to Hugh Roberts superhuman <laughs> over here. Look at that transition. Uh, so can you tell me about your uh, charity, Backyard Footy, your efforts off the pitch? I'm really, I did a little bit of research and followed your podcast, listened to some of the back episodes. Can you tell me about that? How did that come about, the history of it, and what are your plans going forward? Yeah, so honestly, it started here, 2020, COVID year. Um, uh, local comp local podcast reached out to me and was like, hey, do you want to create some Black Lives Matter t-shirts, raise some money to donate to, we partner with Black Love, who I'm still partnered with today in Charlotte, North Carolina, who helps the homeless. 
raise all the money from the proceeds from the t-shirts to give it to Black Love. And I was like, yeah, sure, no brainer. Independence was supportive of it. One day after practice, we had all the guys wearing t-shirts, gave all the guys some t-shirts as well, took some pictures after practice one day too. Not only that, Independence was just supportive, just in general, bringing one of the first black coaches here as well too in 2021 too. It was just, just very impactful. So from there, people reached out to me like, hey, I don't want to really buy a t-shirt. I just want to donate some money to you. So I created a GoFundMe link. We were able to raise close to two to $3,000 for Black Love. And then from there, I was honestly just like, you know, <clears throat> I'm blessed to be in this world in this position for a reason. I'm a faithful guy. My parents told me, you know, it takes a blessing to be a blessing. So the fact that I was able to do that as a professional at that, that point in time, I was like, I got to keep that going. 2021 partner with Food Line here in Charlotte as well too. They were able to host two dinners every single month for the whole season. Not only that, I just raised some money with my performance. So every goal was $10. I think every shutout was $10. Every win was $20. So fans supported me that way as well too. We were able to raise another like three to $4,000. And I hosted like my first uh, charity food drive and clothes drive for Black Love and the Homeless as well too. Then I left to go to California for two years. And you know, it's honestly just one, you know, very blessed just to be the captain. I, I didn't go there with that intention, but from there, I was able to just meet so many people within the community. I was kind of just going with the flow. I wanted to do something. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, some people reached out to me again. I did the same thing I did the year before. With the, based on my performance, every win was $20, every shutout $10, etc. cetera, like that way. Uh, I raised personally $1,500. Somebody matched me $1,500. We raised $3,000, hosted our first uh, food drive and clothes drive in Salinas, California. And then last year, again, I'm just going with the flow kind of thing. I had this mission and vision, what I wanted to do, but not necessarily what I wanted to do. A company in Salinas, California called Enza Zardin, they, who does agriculture in Salinas, which is almost like probably the number one agriculture in the country. They donated $3,000 to the charity as well too. And we not only hosted our first Monterey Foundation in Monterey, we hosted another dinner here with Black Love Charlotte as well too. So now that I'm back here in Charlotte, the intention is to keep that going and keep growing. Honestly, I would love to do a monthly dinner with Black Love. I have my first one this Friday or tomorrow, actually. Awesome. In uh, Uptown as well, too. So I'll be out there. But hopefully to do that monthly, maybe two twice a month kind of thing. And then later in the year, do like some charity food drives, clothes drives for them as well, too. But, you know, just to be in this position, I feel personally it's just my duty to keep that going. I kind of build a relationship with all these people out there as well, too. So who am I to kind of turn my back on them as well? So, you know, that's why I keep these things going. It's so inspirational, man. Uh, I love it. And like I said, uh, I'd recommend listening to the Backyard Footy podcast and some of the back episodes there, what we call like evergreen. You can go back and listen to them and that content still applies. It's still re a really good listen. Um, I did a little bit of uh, sports sociology in college. So the stuff that's kind of in and around the game, like uh, you had some episodes about uh, being like a black coach, being a black player in the league and how that experience is. Um, different, how the resources may not be the same uh, for folks coming up. So I love hearing that you're giving back and, and helping to uh, contribute. And I know I talked with uh, the rest of the leadership team from Mech Reserves. We'd mm -hmm. love to partner with you on something awesome. going forward. Awesome. Uh, and any other players, you know, if you guys have some causes, uh, we want to help promote that, get that out there, support it. Um, that's really good stuff. And uh, I want to go from uh, the heavy stuff back to uh, some more lighter listener questions. And uh, so <laughs> I'm going to start out with uh, Mike Umberger, former president of Mech Reserves here. He wants to know which field player has the most experience in goal? Like if both our keepers get red cards in the game, who's stepping up? I feel like this is an ongoing debate. <laughs> this goes up in the locker room. I got that. No question. <laughs> no question. I got that for the team. I got to do what I got to do. I got to do what I got to do. But you I think, can do anything. I, love yeah. it. I think I think it's easier to say like who we wouldn't throw in there. Yeah. I personally, I wouldn't want to do it. I'll probably give it to somebody else. I want to yeah. stay on the field and, you know, score some goals and defend some goals. But yeah. uh, David said he wants to see Miggy in goal. <laughs> hey, Miggy played basketball, so he has good hand-eye coordination. <laughs> but, yeah. But Stop maybe not the size. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not the size for it, but... Uh, that's great. Uh, so, I, who wouldn't do it? I, I love that. Probably, I would say uh, maybe Luis. Yeah, Luis Alvarez. Probably not Luis, and maybe not Omar. Yeah, yeah Omar. Too. <laughs> uh, from David uh, to Hugh, for the newbies who uh, didn't see you play during your last stop with Charlotte, how would you describe your style of play? I would say I'm a possession on the ball possession base player as well too. I like to 
keep my passing percentage high, but also, you know, break the lines kind of thing. And we like to play at the back, too. That's why I love playing here. So I like to play at the back, kind of deal with pressure. I'd say I'm a calm, smooth kind of player. You can rate myself when you see me on the field, too, but I like to stay calm under pressure kind of thing, too. And then on the defensive side, stay aggressive. I like to win almost all my one-on-one duels and at least make it difficult when you're coming down my side, especially the right side in general, too. It's our side, the right side of the partner, too. I'm hearing so. that mentality, like Clay <laughs> yeah. said, like make folks never want to come back to right. American Legion. Right. That's great. Uh, for Clay, also from David, with your diagnosis, did you ever think that you may not play again? Yeah, for sure. That was the first, when I went to my first appointment, I saw uh, four different neurosurgeons from Mount Sinai, New York, to oh my God. Uh, three down here. The first one I saw was that um, I wouldn't play again and that I'll be lucky to have like any type of active life. So, uh, and then the second one still was like, I don't offer second surgery. So there was no chance of playing. It was just, but he said like I could bounce back actively, but still no playing. So yeah, I heard it for a while. So I was pretty crushed for the first couple of weeks, but um, I'm blessed that I'm back. So you kept that mentality yeah, yeah. though. Yeah. Fought back. I remember uh, when when uh, we spoke uh, before. Maybe it was the Greenville game in the playoffs. Yeah, I think you had said you had just been able to like hold your kids again. Yeah, it took me. Um, my second son, Caden, was born July 18th. Injury happened like two weeks after, and the surgery wasn't until September. So from August to September 14th, and then four weeks after that, they didn't want me doing like too much clinching because if it there was a chance I'd go paralyzed from like. Oh, the, the spinal cord being uh, permanently damaged. So, like, too much clinching or, like, bending over could have made it, like, too compressed. So it was, it was pretty scary, yeah. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. I mean, as a dad, like, carrying your kids. I know, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, from Jenna, super fan Jenna, uh, I guess I've always wondered if Clay, as the captain, has a go-to pep talk for halftime <laughs> when the team isn't doing as well as they need to be. Like, what do you say to give them a little oomph for the second half? Uh, I mean, <laughs> some of it I can't say on here, but I'll just tell them. Usually I do my mo- most of my talking when we're in the huddle, uh, either before the game or at halftime. Um, Mike does a great job addressing the team too, but when it's just us players, I think I'm not a man of like a lot of words with the guys, but when I do speak, I think it carries weight and carries volume. Um, so I'd probably just tell them like, we know we have a target on our back going into the season. We know we always do because we're always going to be a good team. Um, so we have to set the standard. And a lot of times it's just a mentality. And we have to be a bunch of dogs out there and yeah. do whatever it takes to win. So that's probably what I would tell them. And Hugh, you're another leader. Uh, any any uh, approach you have for pepping up, uh, amping up your teammates on the on the pitch or off? Yeah, definitely has some tactics. But I won't, I won't lie, honestly. Um, you know, this is the main guy right here too, so I'm kind of just piggybacking off of him more so. I think right now my role in my position is kind of finding my voice in the team, so my voice is maybe more so positioning everybody on the field, definitely carrying weight on the field right now. But I'll definitely say right now I'm kind of, I'll be like his co-pilot if that makes sense too. So more so finding out when, when the right time to speak is and when the right time to piggyback off him too. So definitely more so fun. Uh, I'm a man of few words as well, too, but I'm, like you said, when your voice is heard and it's impactful, it carries a lot of weight as well, too, and that's the most important thing. I love it. Um, so, there's been a recently announced USL 1 in-season tournament. Mm. Have you guys heard much about that, or is there any way you can prepare for that? What are your feelings and thoughts as players? Yeah, we were actually just talking about that before you came, um, because we want to win. I mean, we want to win everything. So we compared it to the in-season tournament the NBA had this year. Yeah, yeah, And I yeah. think that gave you a good vision. Like, those guys were out to win it. Uh, there was, like, a lot on the line. So, I mean, to be able to look back at the end of the season and say you won the in-season tournament, like the Cup and the um, USL League One Championship, that's the ultimate goal. And now there's two trophies on the line. And every time you play and there's a chance for a trophy, it just makes those games even bigger. So I think we're all aware of it. Well, that's he said it best, exactly. So we got to talk to the team mm-hmm. about getting like a custom pitch out there. Yeah, get, <laughs> so like the court. Yeah, yeah. Get something like a, different, like a jack, like <laughs> cut into the into the yeah. pitch. We we'll have to do something. I don't know what they have up their sleeve, but <laughs> the media team is good, so I'm sure they have something. Let's go. Uh, cool. So for Matt Shaughnessy, uh, I'd be curious to know about the in season tournament, but related, um, what would it mean to bring that trophy and that championship back to Charlotte for you guys? Yeah, I mean a lot. Honestly, I don't think the club has even gotten before this past year. You know, I've even had that opportunity as well too. We've had so many legends here, so many great years. 
so many what ifs, you know. So I, I think for a city since the origin of when the club was founded, it's needed. It's, it's about time, honestly, too. So yeah, I, think, I mean, city of Charlotte as a whole, I think yeah. it goes back to 1982 or three. Last time we won a mm-hmm. championship, yeah, wow, and wow. that was uh, the previous that. pro soccer league. So yeah, you know, soccer's got to hold it up, uh, hold it down for for Charlotte. You yeah, know? I think something that's special about our team too is like a lot of teams. Um, Guys are there one year, two years. Um, people just go there and kind of don't have a lot to play for besides um, their, themselves. But with our team, we have guys that, like myself, six years. Joel's been back and forth, total like maybe eight, nine years. Hugh, four years. Yeah. Gabby, Trey, Shalom, the list goes on and on. Like all, all of us call Charlotte home. So it's not just winning a trophy for, you know, the team, but it's also for the city and our yeah, families and yeah. the fans and so it's true. home for us. So bring a trophy home with me, everything. That'd be awesome. So yeah. sure. Uh, also I, uh, deep cuts here from Matt. Uh, they never announced the score of the friendly with Crown Legacy last year. Oh, yeah. D- do you happen to remember how that one finished? We won, yeah. Oh, let's go. <laughs> yeah, we did win. Um, that's why they didn't post it. That was a good game, though, but yeah, we won. Oh, good to hear, man. All right, that's that's for the uh, soccer sickos. Um, with the mech reserves, we were having a whole conversation, so I think this is from all of us, with uh, our esteemed friends at NCFC uh, running away to a different league at the end of last season. Uh, who would you say is our new rival? Are there any teams that you're circling the dates on the calendar that you have any especially, uh, you know, especially special feelings for? Yeah. Uh, um, from the past two years, I know it was different when Hugh was here, but uh, Greenville's close to us, so that's always going to be a rival because fans can travel both ways. Yep. Um, our games with Northern Colorado always have an extra bite. Uh, I'm not going to say why. I'll let people figure that out. Um, <laughs> so that, wasn't that like that's a weather delay? Really wasn't it like a crazy game yeah, last out year? There, yeah. They had always like a, a little hill delay. storm. Like. <laughs> yeah, so those games always have an extra bite. And then maybe um, Tormenta, because we've seen them in playoffs every year. It and seems like they're big games. Yeah, and those always are always have, like, big games. Implications on the table. Yeah, so I would, I would say those three. I don't know. He has personal ties to a couple, so. Yeah, personally, Richmond is definitely a big one on my list. Yeah. Going to Richmond. I mean, yeah, I haven't been there, honestly, since I left in 2016 either. So, yeah, it's definitely be some little feels with all that, too. That's a big one circled on my list, but. I'm new to the league, so I was just listening for the first time myself who the rivals are, so I take note myself. I was like, all right, cool. There's some new teams, Got to knock too. down some rivals now, too. Got some new rivals on my list as yeah, well. Yeah, there's so. a new team. That's a good point. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I feel like just soccer in general in the Carolinas, we have a lot of new teams at all different levels. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's really exciting, and you guys are playing one of those new teams, the MLS Next Pro yeah. side, Carolina Core, uh, with a really cool Fox logo, and they're just right up the road in North Carolina. So... Mm-hmm. That's the Fan Fest, March 2nd, free admission. We're going to have some fr- family-friendly events. Um, and one of the coolest things, just to circle back, you guys do such a great job of interacting with the fans, hanging out before or after the game. And I know that's going to be one of the things that Fan Fest is signing autographs, uh, getting to meet the, the folks who show up. And uh, it's going to be kind of a festival party atmosphere. What does it mean to you guys to have that relationship with the fans? No, it means a lot, honestly. You know, the fans might not realize, but they motivate us just as well, too. I mean, even when I came back here, have fans DM me saying how happy they are that I'm coming back. It means a lot, honestly. It makes you feel welcome, makes you feel at home, too. It makes interacting with the fans, you know, meaning that much more for us, too, is why we kind of build these relationships to see your son and daughters grow up to maybe even become one of us. You know, there's a women's league now as well, too, so they, the your daughters have an opportunity as well as now too. So to see them grow and blossom, I was actually a coach here as well too. So I got boys that are now in high school and, and they reach out. It's just, it's unbelievable to see them. So to have that impact means a lot for us as well too. And when you guys come to the games and you show the love as well, it, we see you guys sometimes in the stands, it motivates us just as much. Yeah, piggyback off you. It means, all, all of it means so much to us because we know that we can count on you guys like at home games and we feel the support on the road too. And then it just makes it even better because you get to know each other personally and you get to know some names and some faces. And um, I think that familiarity brings uh, a lot of joy to us just as much as y'all. I love it. All right, boys. Well, it's been a pleasure. Uh, hey, I'm Love Wolf Luke. Yeah. Thanks Thank for taking you. the time. We'll see you guys March 2nd, Fan Fest. Yes, sir. Charlotte Independence.